All right, welcome to another episode of the Rapture Hour. Today we're going to be talking about another than Rapture, why we believe that there is a pre-tribulation rapture. And then I'm also, also going to be sharing some comments on my YouTube channel. Sometimes people are for the pre-tribulation rapture. Sometimes they're against it. Sometimes they're upset that people are talking about Jesus coming earlier, sooner than later. Um, and some people are ecstatic that they can't wait that one day they'll see the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. All right, so let's begin. Uh, I'm going to set my timer. The reason why I set my timer, just so I can stay accountable to this hour that you're going to spend with me. So if you can tarry with me one hour, I greatly appreciate it. What's interesting is when Jesus was um, with his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was basically in great stress with the idea that he was going to be crucified. And he uh, would ask his disciples to stay awake, to keep watch, and to tarry with him for one hour because he was going off about a stone's throw away to pray which is an interesting description because I could throw a rock pretty far. So I don't know how far away that would mean. If that means 20 steps, 30 steps. But it, it shows me when I read that story that we can get complacent. We can get into a place where we don't know what's about to happen. And Jesus told his disciples that he was going to have to suffer and then three days later rise from the dead and they had no idea they had no clue they had a lot of sleep in their eyes they're like oh man not another speech it's almost, almost like that no disrespect to the disciples but it got to the point where i think because jesus provided everything for them that they started to get a little sleepy and in the very hour that he needed them awake, they were asleep. And it got to the point where he woke them up a couple of times. And that's when Jesus asked them, could you not tarry for one hour with me? And that hour is not 60 minutes. It's not 60 minutes. When Jesus was saying to them, it wasn't like he was asking them to start a timer like this. And could you just not set your stopwatch for 60 minutes and, 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 and be with me? He's talking about right now in this time frame that he was about to enter into. And he was stressed to the point of where he was bleeding droplets of blood from, from his brow. So much stress. And they, they, they say to us that, like the doctors say, that it is possible to get so stressed out that you are unable to think, move, you become paralyzed. And I believe Jesus was at the point of, of stress because he knew what was coming. And he never, never, never yelled back at anyone, never fought for his life. He was like a lamb that was led to the slaughter. So with that, we're also going to be uh, diving a little bit into the rapture. So hope, hope uh, 
if if you're interested in knowing about why we believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, then this is the channel for you. If you're um, not at all for the pre-trib rapture, this video might not be for you. Uh, but sometimes people are curious because they believe that we're to go through the wrath of God and make it to the other side for some reason. They base a lot of their their the thought process off of when Jesus' disciples was asking him in Matthew 24, what will the signs of the end of time basically be? And Jesus said, you're going to have this, this is going to happen, earthquakes in diverse places, pestilence, all kinds of troubles. Um, but this isn't the end. This is just birth pains. And But before that, you're going to get persecuted. People are going to hate you because of, because of my name. So Jesus kind of tells them the end from the beginning and then bounces back and forth. Part of it started when they started to admire the temple. And then Jesus had mentioned earlier that he, if they destroy this temple, he's going to rebuild it in three days, going back to when King David wanted to build the temple, and God said no, uh, because you're basically paraphrasing because of the wars that you've had, your man of war. And I think part of it could have been that he killed Uriah the Hittite, Bathsheba's husband. It could be something to do with that. And he said, I will I will have someone from your lineage build me a temple. Because he basically told Nathan to, um, the night before Nathan said, do whatever you want. Basically, he just said, you know, you're the king, do whatever you want. And on his way home, God told Nathan and said, actually, go talk to David. Tell him this. So he goes to David, says, you're not going to build a temple, but through your seed, paraphrasing, um, I'm going to have him build a temple for me. Because remember, I never asked anybody to build me a temple. I never asked one person. Instead, I went from tent to tent, from house to house, from body to body, on the outside though. Not like we have the Holy Spirit in us today, but it was a foreshadowing. God was dwelling amidst the camp. So then, God says, I will have someone from your, your lineage build me a temple. He will be my son, and I will be his father. Jesus Christ. But David thought he was meaning Solomon. Because God said that uh, he's not going to, he's not going to um, basically take away from that, from his son's kingdom. That happened to King Solomon. Solomon had the kingdom ripped from him, not in his time, but after he died. And it was never the same since. So King David, I believe, got it wrong. I know it sounds crazy, right? It's not to say that God can't work with people. But David right away says that, that God told him that it was Solomon. We never hear Nathan say Solomon, not for one second. David assumed it was his son. So David drew up the blueprints, exhausted himself writing all the blueprints, and then gave them to his son and said, basically, be a man. Be a man and build this temple. And I've I got resources right down to the nail, <laughs> which is interesting. Got gold, silver for you. Everybody's in agreement. They're going to help you out. Then Solomon says, you know, who am I 
to build you a temple, basically. And what what building can hold God? Like, really? And then he starts prophesying that Israel is going to be carried away. And he raises two hands up, like symbolizing to me, 10 tribes that are going to break apart. Because can you imagine praying this prayer? You're at the pinnacle. You're at the top of the world when it comes to glory for Israel. Doesn't get any better than what they have. They have a king that is wise, that loves God, and all the nations are coming to this king for wisdom. And they're paying tribute, they're paying money, all kinds of stuff, and there's peace, 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 peace everywhere. And then um, King Solomon prophesies over them, saying, if they turn away, if they sin for Every man sins. But if they look towards this temple in this direction and they and they repent and they confess and everything that they that they um, turned against you, that you would pardon their sins. And he says if they're scattered in different lands, that if they turn towards this temple, towards this direction, this temple that you would hear their prayers and bring them back. I can't imagine what the people around him were thinking at the pinnacle, and they're looking around, what's this guy talking about? But I believe the Spirit was moving through King Solomon, that that, that temple was like almost like a beacon to bring his people back because they're going to be scattered. Moses prophesied right away, before they're entering into the Promised Land, he said, look, when I die, you're going to turn away from me. And you're going to go and worship other gods and all kinds of stuff. You're going to do the most hideous crimes. And you're going to be scattered throughout all the nations. But they're going to bring you back one day. Probably on their own dime. That's what I was talking about in earlier videos about a transference of wealth, especially for Israel the nations are going to provide wealth for Israel to bring them back to Israel. All 12 tribes, all of them. Not just for Judah, not just for Benjamin, not just for the Levites, but all of them are coming back. And that whole place is going to be restored one day. That's Israel's program. All right, so enough of that. I want to talk a little bit about lyrics. Because there are people that are <clears throat> asking me to talk about fallen angels and different things. And, and you know, how does that happen? How do they get kicked out of heaven? And why do we take over the rooms in heaven and all this kind of stuff? So you may have heard this. You may have heard me talk about this. You may not have heard me talk about this. But I talk about when Jesus mentioned that there, my father has... Um, mansion has many mansions and, and, and in those mansions are many rooms I believe he's talking about position of authority in heaven principalities, powers, rulers of the air and one day we're taking those seats while we have, we have seats right now in heaven but we're just not heaven is just not under Jesus' control right now and there's different different levels of heaven obviously but you just have to look around and go yeah there the earth isn't run by god just yet by his son jesus christ just yet and now there's heaven there's going to be one day in the future where the devil's going to get kicked out of heaven perhaps the third heaven or whatever like there's probably the lowest part of heaven <clears throat> kick him out, kick a third of his angels out. And as that happens, we're, we're, we're actually going to take over those seats is what I believe. Because Paul says we're seated right now today in heavenly places. And I believe that is higher than all the principalities, powers, rulers of the air. But one day we're going to be judging angels. And one day the Antichrist is going to blaspheme 
God's throne in heaven. He's going to blaspheme against Jerusalem. And he's also going to blaspheme against those that dwell in heaven. And if you think he's talking about in the book of Revelation, if he's, you think he's only talking about angels, I got news for you. There are other people living in heaven right now. All those that die in Christ are in heaven. All right. So let's talk about, I want to talk about some music lyrics because that there's always been hints of rebellion, hints of the Garden of Eden in some of the most popular songs that even I like. And you got to ask yourself, why, why do we like these songs? And there's hints <clears throat> of a rebellion in heaven, both in songs, both in movies, in TV shows. There's just that that seems to be a common theme. Rebellion in heaven, and then also rebellion in the Garden of Eden, seducing Eve, getting kicked out of somewhere, getting kicked out of heaven, getting kicked out of the garden. That, that theme is just it's all over the place. It's like it's built into our DNA to talk about it. And we may not believe it. There's a lot of people that don't believe in God, <clears throat> but they'll quote these lyrics like crazy and they'll play these songs endlessly. This is why I don't listen to rock music or any of that kind of stuff anymore. It's because it, it, it it's catchy and it gets in your mind and you start repeating these um, chants after a while. So let me just read one. From one. I'll just read some lyrics from one song and see if you know um, who this is from. <laughs> some of them are pretty obvious, but uh, it's close to midnight, and something's evils, something evils lurking in the dark under the moonlight. You see a sight that almost stops your heart. You try to scream. But terror takes the sound before you make it. You start to freeze. As horror looks you right between the eyes, you're paralyzed. Because this is thriller, thriller night. And no one's going to save you from the beast about to strike. You know it's thriller, thriller night. You're fighting for your life inside a killer, thriller night. Oh, yeah. Ooh. You hear the door slam and realize there's nowhere left to run. You feel the cold hand and wonder if you'll ever see the sun. <clears throat> you close your eyes and hope that this is just imagination, girl. But all the while, you hear a creature creeping up behind. You're out of time. Because this is thriller, thriller night. There ain't no second chance. Against the thing with 40 eyes, girl, thriller, thriller night. You're fighting for your life inside a killer, thriller night. Night creatures call and the dead starting start to walk in their masquerade. There's no escaping the jaws of the alien this time. They're open wide. This is the end of your life. Ooh, they're out to get you. There's demons closing in on every side. They will possess you unless you change the number on your dial. Take the mark of the beast. Now is the time for you and I to cuddle close together, yeah, all through the night. I'll save you from the terror on the screen. Because there's going to be news outlets all over the world talking about all the terror that's going on. That this... Is thriller, thriller night, because I can thrill you more than any goal would ever dare to try. Thriller night, so let me hold you tight and share a killer, thriller, shiller, thriller here tonight. Because this is thriller, thriller night, girl, I can thrill you more than any goal would ever try. Thriller, thriller night, so let me hold you tight and share a killer. Ow. Are you getting the gist of of what this song is and who and who wrote this song. This is Michael Jackson's one of his first major music videos of all time. Thriller. 
And I used to love this song, man. I had practiced doing the moonwalk. I just want to finish reading the lyrics before I go off on a tangent. <laughs> but this is talking about the tribulation. So if you don't understand that, and if you want to make it through the tribulation, I'm going to thrill you tonight. Darkness falls across the land. The midnight hour is close at hand. Creatures crawl in search of blood. <clears throat> Excuse me. To terror terrorize y'all's neighborhood. Y'all's. <laughs> I'm going to thrill you tonight. And whosoever shall be found without the soul for getting down, without the mark of the beast, must stand and face the hounds of hell and rot inside a corpse's shell. I'm going to thrill you tonight, thriller. Ooh, baby. Ooh, babe. I'm going to thrill you tonight, thriller night. Oh, thriller. Oh, darling. Oh, baby. I'm going to thrill you tonight. Oh, babe. I'm going to thrill you tonight. Oh, darling, thriller night, babe. The foulest stench is in the air. The funk of 40,000 men and grisly goals from every tomb are closing to seal your doom. And though you fight to stay alive, your body starts to shiver. I'm going to thrill you tonight. For no mere mortal can resist the evil of the thriller. Well, <clears throat> if that doesn't... Excuse me, if that doesn't terrify you, I don't know what does. There are still going to be people like FAI Studios that is going to prepare you to withstand hell on earth. It's bizarre. I'm telling you, it's bizarro. The demons can't wait for this moment. There's going to be Nephilim back on this earth again. <clears throat> it'll be just like the days of Noah. If God didn't come back in those days, as in the latter days, there would be no one left. There'd be nothing left on the planet. That's what I've been trying to tell you. That this is coming, but you don't have to be here. There's no reason for you to be here at all. There's nothing for you to prove. All you have to do is just believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you, rose again from the dead, and is alive forevermore. And he'll never die again, nor will you. You'll never have to participate in the second death. You only die one time. So, so let's read another set of lyrics. <clears throat> let's see here. What else do I have? <clears throat> A little parched this morning. All right. Here's another song that was one of my favorites. I never meant to cause you any sorrow. I never meant to cause you any pain. I only wanted one time to see you laughing. I only wanted to see you laughing in the purple rain. It goes on purple rain, purple rain, purple rain. I only want to see you bathing in the purple rain. <clears throat> Probably because she was naked in the Garden of Eden. I never wanted to be your weekend lover. I only wanted to be some kind of friend. Hey, baby, I could never steal you from another. Stealing Eve from Adam. It's such a shame that our friendship had to end. Uh, the devil was cursed and... Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden. Purple rain, purple rain, purple rain. I only want to see you <clears throat> underneath the purple rain. Honey, I know, I know times are changing. It's time we all reach out for something new. That means you too. You say you want a leader, but you can't seem to make up your mind. Whether that means um, she wanted to um, either... Not, not necessarily leave Adam, but maybe she wasn't quite happy. Maybe the devil appealed to her just a little bit more because he had money. He had fame. He had wealth. He had power. And it was very enticing for her. And also giving her 
the hint that, hey, if you partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, you're going to be like God. You're going to know everything just like him. So it was very tempting for her. You, you say you want a leader, but you can't make up your mind. I think you better close it and let me guide you to the purple rain. Purple rain, purple rain, purple rain, purple rain. Ooh, if you know what I'm singing about up here, come on, raise your hand, purple rain. Yeah, <clears throat> I only want to see you, see you in the purple rain. And I think that's it. Yeah, so this this was, this basically blew up Prince to the point where, like, he wrote all the songs just almost overnight. He was inspired, I believe, by the devil. Like him or not, I believe there is an influence whether or not he worshipped the devil directly. That's not necessarily what I'm saying. I'm just saying that people that want wealth in this fashion will be willing to sell their soul to the devil. And they're going to get wealth, but it's but they're basically signing a contract with death. And uh, as soon as that fame happens, then the next thing you know, they're gone. And sometimes horrible, horrible deaths. And part of it is sometimes these 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 elites they they change their look, they car they start carving up their faces. And I believe that's an attack by the enemy as well. Like, look at Michael Jackson. Like, man, he, whoever was working on his face messed up big time. Like, I thought he was perfectly fine when he created his first album. <clears throat> and I love albums, love records, all that kind of stuff. Um, Yeah, so one more, one more. This one's another popular one right here. <clears throat> See if you can pick up on what this one is. This one, you should be able to guess right away. Very popular, very popular song. Let's go. Steve walks warily down the street with the brim pulled way down low. Ain't no sound but the sound of his feet. Machine guns ready to go. Are you ready? Hey, are you ready for this? Are you hanging on the edge of your seat? <clears throat> Again, talking about rooms in heaven. Seats. We have seats in heavenly places. So in this song, are you hanging on the edge of your seat? Out of the doorway, the bullets rip to the sound of the beat. Yeah. Another one bites the dust. Another one bites the dust. And another one gone. Another one gone. Another one bites the dust. Talking about the devil and his angels killing people. How do you think I'm going to get along without you when you're gone? You took me for everything I had and kicked me out of my own. Interesting, right? So this is talking about the devil being kicked out of heaven. Are you happy? Are you, are you satisfied? <clears throat> How long can you stand the heat out of the doorway? The bullets rip to the sound of the beat. Look out. Another one bites the dust. It's interesting that they use dust because man was created from dust and to dust he will return. So this is the devil and his cohorts running around during the tribulation, killing people. Guys, if you don't get this, they're telling us what they're going to do. They're telling us. They can read the Bible as well. They can read the book of Revelation. See, look, look, guys, we lose. So we got to take as many out as we can. And they're going to be able to do that during the tribulation. <clears throat> oh, take it. Bite the dust. Bite the dust. Hey, another one bites the dust. Another one bites the dust. Ow. Another one bites the dust. Hey, another one bites the dust. Hey, ow. Shout. There are plenty of ways that you can hurt a man and bring him to the ground. You can beat him. You can cheat him. You can treat him bad. And leave him when he's down. Yeah, that sounds like beat it. Maybe we should look up the lyrics on beat it. But that sounds like beat it right there. Michael Jackson's beat it. I'm ready. I'm ready for you. I'm standing on my own two feet. Out of the doorway. Bullets rip. Repeating to the sound of the beat. Oh, yeah. Another one bites the dust. Another one bites the dust. Another one gone. Another one. They don't care 
about mankind. Uh, if you don't understand that, the devil and his angels do not care about mankind. Shootout, uh, yeah, all right. So that was a very popular, very popular song. I think I sang that song as a kid as well. Didn't want to go to church when I was young. Liked the music, didn't want to go to church. Is there a correlation? Quite possibly. I do think music obviously affects your mind, especially when you're repeating this stuff over and over. It doesn't take much. I can have this song in my head right now. I can find that database somewhere in my head. Just out of curiosity's sake, let, uh, let me look up Beat It. I could be wrong. I remember looking up this one, but let's look up Beat It lyrics. I'm going to assume that it's talking about taking out mankind. They told him, don't you ever come around here? Don't want to see your face. You better disappear. There's fire in their eyes and their words are really clear. So beat it, just beat it. You better run. You better do what you can. Don't want to see no blood. Don't be a macho man. You want to be tough. Better do what you can. So beat it. You want to be bad. Just beat it, beat it, beat it. No one wants to be defeated. Showing how funky and strong is your fight. It doesn't matter who's wrong or right. Just beat it, beat it, beat it. They're out to get you. Better leave all you can. Don't want to be a boy. You want to be a man. You want to stay alive. Better do what you can. So just beat it. Like it's telling you what you're going to have to face through the tribulation. If you stick around here. If you like some people are saying, man, we want to be left behind. We want to. Good luck. All right, uh, let's see. You have to show them that you're really not scared. You're playing with your life. There ain't no truth. This ain't no truth or dare. They'll kick you. Then they'll beat you. Then they'll tell you it's fair. So beat it, beat it. But you want to be bad. So beat it, beat it. No one wants to be defeated. Showing how funky and how strong is your fight. Doesn't matter who's wrong or right. Just beat it, beat it. No one wants to be defeated. Showing how funky and strong is your fight. Doesn't matter who's wrong or right. Just beat it, beat it. Beat it, beat it, beat it, beat it. Beat it. No one wants to be defeated. Just beat it. No one wants to be defeated. Showing how funky. Like the lyrics are pretty basic. But basically, it's like, look, there is no right and wrong. No one's right or wrong. It's just this is what's going to happen. It doesn't matter if you're righteous or not righteous. You're going to get beat down. And you want to be a man. You want to be tough. You want to make it through the tribulation. You want to buy weapons. You want to do all this kind of stuff gallons of water to save you all the stuff and i'm here to tell you that that's not going to work you're going to be faced with the choice one day to take the mark of the beast and that's not going to be an easy choice it's not going to be easy but those that take the mark are going to get tossed into the lake of fire now maybe there's some way to get rid of the mark of the beast because jesus kind of gives a hint saying look it's better for you to cut off your arm than enter into <clears throat> basically hell hellfire with with two arms so he's saying basically cut off your hand it's better for you to enter into heaven one hand better to enter in, in with one eye into god's kingdom with one eye than to be cast into hell and fire with two eyes so what's he talking about here i think he could be hinting at the idea of the mark of the beast that maybe people are going to try and gouge it out. Maybe it's going to be an implant in their eye. Maybe it's in their brain. I don't know. Maybe it's in their hand and they think they can cut it off and that'll save them. I don't know. But it's interesting that you can almost type in any lyric. This is an example right here. Um, but yeah, there's so many songs I could just go on. I could make this a whole episode about music, hinting, not even hinting, telling us outright what's going to happen during the tribulation. And the fallen angels are salivating at the mouth, they can't wait to take us out. And we'll just be another statistic to them, another one bites the dust, no problem. You don't want to be around. 
the Holy Spirit is removed. We are removed with the Holy Spirit. You're not going to be able to find churches that believe in Jesus Christ. Instead, it's going to be about money, all kinds of stuff, and people are going to be betraying each other. It's not a good time to be around. And there's going to get a point where people are going to want to die and they won't be able to. So think about that one. There will be groups of individuals that will want to commit suicide and they won't be able to. Why? Maybe that's some kind of a program that's in Neuralink that gets implanted into your head and you can't do it. You can't, you can't do it. You can't do anything to end your life. I don't know. Is that another pandemic or something where you get put into an incubator, if you will, something shoved down your throat and you, you can't, you can't die and you're poisoned for like five months. Don't know. Suddenly it gets pretty quiet, doesn't it? Yeah, because this is not, it's not fun times. And the, this is part of the reason why I don't like talking about the news and talking about people dying all over the world and talking about Israel going to war with other nations and all this kind of stuff. I, I'm, I'm not a fan of that because <clears throat> there are, <clears throat> imagine you have a loved one in Israel. Imagine you have a loved one in Iran. I have friends that are from Iran, Persians. I have friends that are in Ukraine. I have friends that are Russians. I have Chinese friends. So we have to be careful when we just throw out things like, man, it's coming, all these nations coming against Israel. You know, there's going to be a war and millions of people are going to die and all this kind of stuff. It's, it sounds cold after a while. You start sounding cold like you start going, oh, I'll, that's in the Bible. Another one bites the dust. We get cold talking about this stuff. And I never want to be there. I never want to be at the point where I am cold hearted, where my heart is so cold that I can just throw out stats and go, hmm, yeah, we should pray for them. But then we don't we don't really think about this either. We just throw it out there. And then we also don't know how to blush anymore. And I say we don't know how to blush, it's because we watch porn, we watch movies people being tortured killed horror movies all this kind of stuff you read magazines whatever it is we just don't know how to blush anymore and we don't know how to mourn properly we don't know how to how to cry we don't know how to weep we basically we're just like it's like we've heard it all we've seen it all on tiktok on instagram on Facebook, on YouTube, we've seen so many images, just millions of images across the screen. <clears throat> and we get to the point where nothing phases us. We just throw out numbers. Yeah, 400 people died. So sad. So sorry for them. Let's pray for them. And then, oh, and 14 died over here. So sad. And there's a war coming to Israel and millions are going to be killed. So sad. But we're out of here. Like, <clears throat> I never want to come across as cold. A cold fish like that. Like, that sounds pretty cold. Jesus Christ himself does not want anyone to perish. And if, if his rapture is delayed, there's a reason for it. Because there's, there's more people coming in. But there will come a time where that, there's going to be a cap. That's it. No more Gentiles coming in. No more Jews coming in. It's full. And now we're out of here and the Antichrist has to be revealed pretty much at the same time. And when that happens, there's going to be a big interruption all over the world. This is why I, I keep saying it on my channel. The next big Black Swan event is going to be the rapture. It's going to rock people's worlds. They're going to be like, oh, we should have saw it coming because that's the third thing that you need for a Black Swan event. The first one is it's a surprise. 
and nobody saw it coming. The second one is there has to be either a new invention or it has to be catastrophic world changing, like a world changer. It has to change the way that we operate, the way we live our lives. The mark of the beast doesn't do that. I don't know what else does. <clears throat> it's going to change your life. You're going to be running for your life. And then the third thing is hindsight bias. On the other side, you're going to all of a sudden go, yeah, I knew. I knew this all along. I knew this was happening. Well, you didn't make a decision. And now you got to go through the tribulation because that door is gone. The door is sealed. Just like in Noah's day. When a flood comes, you don't see it until your cars start floating away. Until the furniture in your basement starts rising from the floor. Then you go, oh, this is a serious flood. Serious flood. Hmm. I thought this was just a seasonal thing. When fires encroach around you, you don't know it. You just see smoke and you're like, wow, smoke's getting bad. I wonder if maybe we should evacuate. Sometimes it's too late. Sometimes it's just, it's too late. So people are saying, what about those that get left behind and all this kind of stuff? This is why we're trying to save as many people as possible. <clears throat> and there's a couple of ways. You don't have to be fearful. We're not asking you to be fearful of the Lord coming. You don't have to be fearful. But there's nothing that you can do to prepare yourself for this. You can't prepare for it. A third of the world is going to be wiped out. So it doesn't matter what you try and prepare and how many courses you take on preparing, on getting you through the tribulation. It would be like taking swimming lessons while the ark is being built. It doesn't matter how good of a swimmer you are. That When that door closes, that's it. There's no getting in. And that's what we're talking about here. There are people that will literally tell you to that they say you want to be the person left behind. And I, I ask myself, why do they want to do that? Is it because of money? Is it because they want to extend their ministry and make more money and bring it all in? And then all of a sudden the tribulation happens and they're somewhat protected because they have all your money and you have nothing. something to think about i know this is a little bit more of a serious tone today but i think it's important <clears throat> it's in movies the movies are warning us that there's something different there's something coming and i, I mentioned uh in september september 29th there's a movie called the creator talking about only good people go to heaven Talking about artificial intelligence, hybrids, half man, half machine, not being able to enter into heaven because they're not human anymore. It will get to a stage where we won't be able to tell who's a person and who's a, an android, who's a machine. That's been hinted at ever since Blade Runner and other movies. There's so many movies about an invasion, so many movies about being abducted by aliens. They're prepping us. The world is prepping us right now to stay and go through the tribulation. And not to accept that someone from heaven is coming back for his people to rapture us up. They're prepping us so that when it does happen, they're going to have an answer. And they're going to have a media blitz so that we'll, the people that are left behind are going to be terrified and say, yeah, we don't want these aliens coming back anymore interesting right so i don't know i don't have i don't have an answer for people that want to make it through the seven year tribulation i don't i don't have any answers for you to say how do you how do you get through it cuz i don't believe we're going to be here it's like you don't want to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 
but you want to somehow survive the tribulation. That just that just kind of tells you a little bit of where your your heart is right now. It's still a little bit hard. And there is time right now. There is time to think about this. There's time to do your due diligence. Maybe, maybe God is drawing you right now through his Holy Spirit to draw you to a channel like this that says, you know what, maybe you got to think about this kind of stuff. Maybe you should go to church on a Sunday. Pack up your family. Take them out on a Sunday morning. Find a church. Go to a church. And let the Holy Spirit talk to you in that service. <clears throat> and then just accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's easy. Why? Because it's been done. Jesus saved us. All we have to do is just confess that he is Lord. We don't have to weep. We don't have to cry. We don't have to do all this kind of stuff. He's going to wipe every tear from our eye. We already have remorse, all this kind of stuff. Just turn to him and then edify the church, especially the church. People that believe, that's your that's your vocation, is to prep each other for heaven. How do you do that? You read your word. You love on each other, even your enemies, any, any even people that come against you. You love on them. <clears throat> there are going to be some people that say, oh, I can't love this person, can't love that person, whatever it is. You know, like, you're going to have to make some changes. And the only way for that to happen is by reading your Bible. When you read your Bible, all of a sudden you will get a snapshot. I would say start with the book of Romans. It's the foundation of our faith. If you read Romans over and over, like I did about a year and a half ago, I read it every day in its entirety for a month, and it clicked. I suddenly realized what God did for us. Now it's reasonable for me to serve him. It's reasonable for me to preach and teach and tell everyone about Jesus Christ. That is just my reasonable service. I'm not doing it for anything, <clears throat> to gain anything. I do it because it's reasonable. It's just what a servant does. Jesus gave a parable saying, you know, like when a servant comes in from the, or when a, when a leader, a ruler comes in from the field, working in the field, sits down at the table and the servants are putting food at the table and all kinds of stuff. And then they stand by. Does he say thanks to them? No. Why? Because that's their job. It's reasonable. That's what they get paid to do. You know, it's like thanking people in the restaurant. You can be courteous and all that. It's not what I'm saying. But it's like thanking them, saying, man, just thank you. Wow, you really blessed me today. They're, most waiters and waitresses would be like, yeah, okay, whatever. This is what I get paid to do. I don't want to be here today, but it's my job. So if you thank me, don't thank me. I'm still going to give you the service. <laughs> that's what That's what they do. They serve you. It's like Safeway or any grocery store. Now they make you bag your own groceries. So it's kind of like you should thank yourself, pat yourself on the shoulder and say, man, I didn't know that I had a job today. I didn't know that I worked part-time at a grocery store. I have to bag my own stuff. Anyways, let's get into some of the comments and then we'll wrap, wrap this up. <clears throat> Um, yeah. So it does, does feel imminent, it does feel imminent. Jesus coming. All right. Uh, let's see. Here's a comment on one of my videos, the rapture hour. This was episode number two, directed energy weapons. Uh, I talked a little bit about that, my thoughts on that. So if you haven't seen that episode, check it out. Uh, fire coming down from the sky. Yeah, that sure, that sure seems like it. Um, you're going to see media outlets say, no, 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 that's just wind. It's just wind that look that comes down like a beam from satellites. <laughs> uh, many look for the Savior and the Messiah, Jesus' first coming, 
to the earth. A savior knew very well that if the heir of the savior would be born in this world, needless to give examples. Similarly, with regard to Jesus, and this is from uh, Anil Mendes. There are so much more signs say that, yeah. So I think what this guy is saying is in Jesus' day, there were many that were looking for signs and stuff and, and they still didn't they still didn't see it. Some did, some didn't. They didn't know that Jesus was right with them. Even the disciples had a hard time with that. They just thought he was going to restore Israel to be the light of the world right then and there, take over Rome, all this stuff. And meanwhile, Jesus had to die, had to die on the cross. And they didn't see it. They didn't believe it. They didn't see it. They didn't believe any of the scriptures, any of the prophecies, nothing until Jesus rose from the dead. And then it clicked for them. Lot's wife looking back. This is uh, from Al 4909. Talking about Lot. Lot's wife looking back makes me think of all those who put faith in men who claim the coming of a prosperity and plenty. Men who claim speak for God saying uh, is coming to believers prior to the rapture. They love the world and I think that's why they deny scriptures this time we are in today. Uh, Bo Punley comes to mind but there are many that preach this deception. Now I was talking about a, a transfer of wealth meaning I believe God will help those people get out of debt because God does not like debt. And I'm not saying live foolishly and all this kind of stuff. I'm saying that he'll help you clean up the books before he comes. Because otherwise, you're all you're doing is you're transferring the debt to the people that you, you serve right now. And I believe just like in the days of Exodus, when Israel came out, the people gave them money. They had no money. They were in debt. They had quotas to fulfill for Pharaoh. And they were getting behind on those quotas, getting behind on their bills. And then one day, the majority of Egyptians gave them their wealth and said, go. And I believe something like that is going to happen where people are going to be cleaning up their debts. Does that mean everybody... I I don't know. I don't I don't think so. But I think there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be creative in making money so that we can depart in peace if we will and not be a burden to other people. That's the, this is just me saying this because some people are like, "Well, I can act foolishly now with my money. I can do all kinds of crazy stuff and then be out of here and escape." And I'm saying, I don't think that's the way that we're supposed to think. I think we're supposed to serve the people that we work for to the best of our ability, make them the most money, make them profitable, be the best employee, be the best that you can do, and be that light, be that example of a hard worker. Put your head down, put your back into it, work hard, and do this until the Lord comes. And that's what I'm talking about, a wealth transfer. I'm not talking about getting rich, like just so you can get rich and then go sit on the beach and stuff. Now, I do like the idea of being on the beach. Not going to lie to you. I like that. I like reading books on a beach. But that's not what I'm not talking about, a wealth transfer to get rich. I'm talking about a wealth transfer to clean up all your debt so that you are free to minister the gospel and you're free to be raptured, if you will. <clears throat> I believe that's natural. And there's going to be people that will be arguing with me on this. They'll be commenting and saying, you're you're just trying to be greedy. I don't I don't want any of your money if you're if you're like that and you're if you're thinking that way. God is already providing for me through this channel, through this medium through a secular organization. Why do I need your money? Don't need your money. I have a secular organization paying me to preach the gospel. And so when I when I talk about a wealth transfer, I honestly believe if you're doing right the right things, 
you're going, God is going to reward you in this life and in the life to come. That's what I'm talking about. Most people work for secular organizations. Let's just be real here. So that's what I'm talking about. You need to bless those people that are paying you. They created a business out of thin air. They spent the time and energy and they're paying you. So work for it. Work hard for it. And I believe you'll have creative ways that that will come to you that will be effortless. And all of a sudden your bank account is going to get to the point where you're full. <clears throat> you've paid all your bills and you could start sleeping a little bit better at night, knowing that the Lord is, is coming soon. That's what I believe. That's what I honestly believe. You do the right things for a long enough period of time. Good things will happen. That's all I'm talking about. I'm not trying to make this anything crazy, super spiritual. All right, so we are coming to the end of this video. So I want to read from 1 Thessalonians 4. I talked about 1 Corinthians 15 in the last episode, so I'm going to go to 1 Thessalonians 4. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, let's see here. Let's go. Coming of the Lord. So Paul is talking to the Thessalonians and saying that there were letters. People are saying that the day of the Lord is at hand, the day of Christ. And Paul's like, that day can't happen until the son of perdition be revealed. So don't worry about that. I've told you about this before. Don't worry about that. So he's trying to comfort them. He's saying, I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. They're worried that their, their friends that died in Christ that are asleep are just stuck in the ground. And Paul is saying, look, don't be sorry like even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So the people that sleep in Christ, God is bringing with him. And this is interesting that Paul says, God will bring with him. Because Jesus is God, God the Son. For we say this unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Again, Paul's saying this. We're not preventing them that are asleep from going to heaven. They're in heaven. They're living in heaven. They're quite happy. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, which is probably Michael, the seventh angel, seventh trumpet, if you will, and with the trump of God. His voice is going to sound like thunder. It sounds like a trumpet. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. So that's a category of dead people. <laughs> Those that slept in Christ. They have, it says here, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The dead in Christ rise first. Why? Because that's what they do. When, they're, when you die in Christ, you rise first, right away. That's what Paul's talking about here. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. These are all the witnesses. <clears throat> to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we be ever with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. These are comforting. People get hung up on the dead. They're like, the dead in Christ are dead in the ground. And, and oh, time's up. And Paul's saying, the dead in Christ shall rise first. That sounds like a first resurrection to me. All right. So that's it for this one. That's it for this episode. I hope you got something out of it. And uh, I'll see you in another episode. Feel free to comment. Uh, feel free if you've watched this video to the end. Uh, feel free to subscribe to this channel. Feel free to share this to your loved ones to say, look, Consider this what this guy says about 
um, the rapture, the pre-tribulation rapture. Hopefully, I, I'm building a case for you over these few episodes that I'm doing about the rapture. The one-hour rapture. One hour, the rapture hour, I should say. All right. Thanks a lot. See you guys later. Bye for now.